Presenting History's Best on PBS. Funding for the 50 Years' War, Israel and the Arabs, was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and PBS viewers like you. Victory in the war has not brought the hoped-for solution to all the problems in this part of the Middle East. Egypt, for example, declares that she will not reopen the Suez Canal until Israel gives up Arab territory she has conquered, which the Israelis are not prepared to do. Israel's new Prime Minister, Mrs. Golda Meir, visited troops in the Sinai Desert, not far from the Suez Canal, where the shells continue to fly. He wanted a chance to inspect and talk to the men who were living face to face with the realities of the Middle East situation. The death of President Gamal Abdel Nasser after 18 years in power devastated Egypt and the entire Arab world. His successor, Vice President Anwar Sadat, was considered little more than a figurehead. Those in Nasser's inner circle thought they could steer policy on the course set by Nasser. And they were confident that Sadat would follow the party line. The funeral was a grand occasion for the leaders of the Arab states and Nasser's Soviet allies. Nasser had severed relations with America, so the representative from Washington assumed he would be ignored. Then a soldier came into the room weaving his way through the crowd. Apparently, it turned out heading for me. The soldier led Richardson away, out of the sight of the world's press and the watchful eye of the KGB. I was trained to spot anything that was going on, but it was difficult in that chaos. We went down the stairs, the lower floor, was darkened and propped up in the hospital bed was the man who had just inherited the presidency of Egypt. President Sadat was resting away from the crowds after apparently suffering from heat stroke. He said that he wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to turn a new page in the relationship between our countries. The next day, Sadat put on a show for the American media. Egypt was a Soviet client state. Sadat considered Israel to be an American one. The United States provide Israel from the loaf of bread to the phantom to the, uh, to the even deficit in the budget itself. So it is the vein of life. Vein of life for Israel goes from the United States. Sadat didn't want to negotiate with Israel himself. He wanted the Americans to intervene, to deliver to Egypt the territories lost in 1967. In the three years since the war, Israel had established a formidable defense line along the Suez Canal, 70 miles from Cairo. What are you doing? I'm getting ready to blast you Israelis. Why? Because you Israelis occupy our land. The Suez Canal had been closed since 1967. Sadat now told the Americans that if Israel moved back a few miles from the canal, he would reopen it, even to ships trading with Israel. Sadat's proposal followed statements made by Moshe Dayan, Israel's defense minister. Dayan said that the Sinai should eventually be returned to Egypt. But 
we say is that we sit there just because the war is going on. But once you agree to make peace agreement, we don't think that we should sit on your Suez Canal. Golda Meir didn't want to negotiate through the Americans. She wanted direct talks with Sadat. I'm prepared to go to Cairo, I'm prepared to go to Damascus, I'm prepared to go to Amman, I'm prepared to go to Beirut, anywhere. You would go to these places? Yes, yes. happily. To negotiate peace, of course. In Washington, President Nixon looked for the right person to urge Sadat's proposal on Golda Meir. He chose Joe Sisko. I can recall the words to this day. He said, Joe, press Golda. Press her hard, but don't cause uh, a major Donnybrook uh, between Israel and the United States. Sisko met with the entire Israeli cabinet, but only Golda Meir negotiated. Golda Meir took it upon herself to do all of the talking. It was interesting to see everyone here, all the ministers, nobody opening their mouth. What they did to release their attention was sending little notes to each other. I sent Diana Chet saying, listen, Moshe, I think we can get you some support. He sent back a very uh, abrupt reply saying uh, sarcastically, thank you very much. But if Golda is not for this, then I'm not for it either. Siskut saw that something was happening, that nobody was supposed to speak there. And so uh, he was a very smart negotiator. He asked uh, the prime minister whether he's permitted to ask the minister of defense one question, a professional question. So what could she say? And I said to him, uh, uh, Mr. Minister, uh, if we don't do anything, uh, what do you think is going to happen? Dayan said, well, uh, I cannot imagine that uh, any government will tolerate uh, indefinitely a situation where a strong army is poised at the gates of its capital. He was exaggerating. After all, our forces <clears throat> were at a distance of more than 100 kilometers from Cairo, and uh, this will lead to war. Golda Meir still insisted on direct talks. The next day, I walked up with these flowers, uh, rather gingerly, and she said to me, oh, Joe, now you're saying it with flowers. It won't do you any good. In Cairo, Israel's rebuff almost brought about the downfall of the man who had proposed the initiative, Anwar Sadat. So he reversed course and tried a tactic more likely to win Arab support. War is now inevitable. Whatever the price, whatever the sacrifice, we will not back down. We will not give up one centimeter of Arab land. I thought of Sadat as a character out of Aida. I didn't take him seriously. He kept making grandiloquent pronouncements. He never acted on them. So I, frankly, thought he was bluffing. Kissinger was too preoccupied with the Vietnam War to give the Middle East much attention. Even when Sadat made another offer. He wanted Israel to return to the 67 borders in return for which Egypt would be willing to make peace, which was a big step because not no Arab state had as yet ever flatly said that they would make peace. Uh, we were in no position to handle that. Sadat told me that Kissinger had said, if all you have is a problem, I cannot deal with it. But if it becomes a crisis, then I can intervene. Disappointed with American diplomacy, yet still unwilling to talk to Israel directly, Sadat set out to prepare for war. 
The high command met at Sadat's house in Giza. Sadat told us, there is no hope of a peaceful solution, and I will not surrender to Israel. So our only option is war. He said, get me back just 10 centimeters of the Sinai, and I will negotiate a miracle. Sadat then proposed a secret alliance with President Assad of Syria. They agreed to plan a joint attack on Israel. Syria's top generals sailed to Alexandria to meet their Egyptian counterparts. 